Our scripture lesson this morning is taken from Luke chapter 1, verses 26 through 38. In the sixth month, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will be with child and give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age, and she, who was said to be barren, is in her sixth month, for nothing is impossible with God. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May it be to me as you have said. And then the angel left her. Here ends the reading of his holy word. So welcome everyone to the fourth Sunday in Advent. This is of course the Sunday uh, where we talk about love. Now I know that that's not a surprise to any of you, but it also happens to fall on Christmas Eve this year, the fourth Sunday in Advent. So while I'm happy to get a chance to talk to you about love this morning, I hope to get a chance to talk to you this evening as well. Now, you may recall that a few weeks ago, and if you don't, that's perfectly fine. If you're anything like me asking you to remember something a few weeks ago is like a nearly impossible task. But you may recall a few weeks ago when we talked about peace, uh, we talked about how it seems as if everyone in the world wants world peace, right? It's something that's universally sought after. And if, if that is the case, I believe that uh, love is something that is even more wanted in this world. Have you ever stopped to think about how much this world is driven by the search for love? Now, we also talked about, in our week of peace, we talked about how there is an economy that's been built up around the idea of finding peace, especially within ourselves, and if that is true, how much greater is the economy that has been built up in this world around the idea of finding love? There are dozens, if not hundreds, of online sites that have been set up to try and help people find love. I mean, it's gotten so uh, specific now, each of these sites, that you can choose a person from a certain faith group, or you can choose a person that has a certain uh, group of specific things that they like. So it's, it's become almost something like this. Are you a farmer that drives only a Ford truck, but at the same time you only love John Deere tractors? Do you also happen to own an Australian cattle dog? Do you specialize in raising hogs? Great news, we have a dating site that is specifically tailored to who you are and to find someone who shares your exact interests. Now, that's a bit of an exaggeration. I don't know that they go quite that deep into detail, but it's gotten to be just like that, that you're trying to find the perfect match based on exactly who you are. Now, the online dating, it's not super new, but uh, it's a bit newer. But this idea of finding love is uh, nothing new, right? Or someone finding love for you is nothing new. In the old days, there were matchmakers. Now, there are still people that like to play matchmaker in this world, right? Um, that is very true. But in the old days, it was done by matchmakers. And sometimes a matchmaker was just a kindly old lady at the church, who happened to see a single man and a single woman and would do everything she could in her power 
to bring them together. You know, I, I count myself lucky, and this may sound a bit odd, I count myself lucky that I am not a uh, young single pastor. Because there are countless stories of young single pastors that go into the church before they are married. And you know, all of a sudden, everyone's cousin who isn't married magically starts to come to that church. It's like they've come out of the woodwork. All the unmarried uh, uh, women have come, decided to start coming to church. And you hope that they're coming for the right reason, right? You hope that they're coming to, to worship God. But a lot of the times it's to meet the new young pastor and then potentially get to know him and hopefully marry him. And that's something that has gone on for a very long time. You know, we haven't had that situation uh, in this church in quite some time, but we did it one time. If you remember back, I, uh, I certainly do remember that. But uh, when we consider the entertainment that we take in, in this world, this idea of love, we get an even greater view of how much people are searching for or are enthralled by this idea of love. You know, I know a lot of people like to watch Hallmark movies this time of year, right? Um, a lot of people like to watch them all year round. Uh, my parents love, well, my mom loves to watch them all year round, and my dad gets to sit there and watch them with her. Um, and so... This time of year, you know, they're, they're very popular. And so what's a Hallmark movie all about, right? Uh, it's a young woman decides to move back to her hometown after spending years in the city of chasing her dreams. And as she moves back to her hometown, she falls in love with the uh, kindly Christmas tree farmer who also happens to play Santa at the orphanage every year, right? That's what a Hallmark movie tends to, to be about, something like that. Uh, how about uh, romantic comedies? You know, there are always like three romantic comedies in the theater at any given time. And it always seems like it's maybe the same 10 actors and actresses that fall in love all the time over and over again in these movies. What about the music that we have in the world? Think about all the songs that have ever been written. If you really stop to listen to them, I'm going to bet like 50% at least of them have been written about love in some way. When we look at the world of literature, how many books are written around love stories? Again, there are tons that are about finding love. And what's our most famous love story from literature? Well, I think you could argue that it's William Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet, right? Because I can say Romeo and Juliet, and most of you automatically know what I'm talking about, right? But have you ever stopped to think about the story of Romeo and Juliet and the love that is there? Well, if you haven't, let's just have a brief synopsis. Um, it's, it's interesting to think about this as love because it's really a story about two teenagers who meet each other and fall in love in less than a week. And in less than a week from meeting one another, they are now both dead because of that love. You know, when I hear someone talk about Romeo and Juliet and wanting that kind of love in their life, I almost want to stop and say to them, did you read the whole story? Did you get to the end of that story? Because if you got to the end of that story, I don't think you want that kind of love in your life. Now, perhaps as we've gone through the Advent season, you've noticed that I've tried to talk about each week what the world defines as our topics of Advent. So what the world will define as hope, peace, joy, and this week, love. And I've tried to offer you a counterexample of what God offers us as the ideas of hope, peace, joy, and love. And what we've seen throughout Advent is that in each of the weeks is the world has one view of one of these things, and God has another view of one of these things. And I hope that you have found throughout this season of Advent that the idea that what the world believes is nowhere near as powerful as what God believes. So this week, as we talk about what the world offers or looks for as love, we can see how the love of God is much greater than those. So when we talk about love in the world, we are almost always talking about the idea of romantic love, right? And all of the examples that I gave you this morning, those are ideas of romantic love. And romantic love is a good thing. 
It absolutely is. When it's between people the way God intended it to be, it is a wonderful thing. There is no problem with romantic love. But the real issue with romantic love that can happen is that it's not always an unconditional love. Now, there are times when it is very close to being an unconditional love, right? When a couple has been married for 60 years, that is a romantic love that has come as close to unconditional love as you can get. Because I will tell you, I have not been married that long. And I have a marriage that I believe is very loving and one that I value very much. But it is not an unconditional love. And I will tell you why. Because I know there are things that I could choose to do that would ruin that love. Now, I'm not going to do those things, right? Obviously, I'm not going to go out and do those things. But the possibility does exist for that to happen. When we compare the idea of what the world believes love is and what God has for us as love, the big difference is God's love is unconditional. Meaning that there is nothing that we can do that would stop God from loving us. Oh, there are things we can do that he's not going to like. There are things that we can do that push ourselves and move ourselves further away from God's love. But God's love remains steadfast. See, whenever we feel as if we've lost the love of God in our lives, that is not because God has stopped loving us. It is because we have chosen to go down a path that has led us further away from where his love is. But his love for us never changes. Even in those moments, his love for us never fails because it is a perfect love. The closest thing that we can have, I believe, in this world to the love that God has for us is the love that we have for our children and our family, right? You know, my children, I hope that they know that my love for them is unconditional. And again, I know there will be times when they will do things that I don't like. They will make decisions that I don't agree with or I won't approve of, but I will never stop loving them. So how does the love of God for us as his children differ from the love that parents have for their children if they are both unconditional love. Well, here is the difference. And I must say, unfortunately, it is a sad thing. The problem is this. Though a lot of us, if not almost all of us, have grown up with parents that love us, there are children in this world that grow up with parents that do not love them. There are children in this world that grow up without that unconditional love. See, the difference is God's love is for each and every one of us, without exception. So during the season of Advent, I think it's easy for us to get a sense of the love that God has for us because we are focused on the expression of that love. Well, at least we should be focused on the expression of that love. And the expression of the love that God has for us is seen in the birth of Jesus Christ. The love that he has for us is so great that he sent his only son to live among us so that we could have a closer relationship with him. See, because without Jesus coming, without his birth, and without us dying on the cross, our sin would ultimately separate us from God. And God loves us so much that he doesn't want to have that separation. That is the expression of God's love. And that is perfect love. So as we move forward from the season of Advent, let us hold tight to the perfect love that God has for us. Let us celebrate the birth of Jesus and the perfect love that has come to life through him. My challenge for you this week is this. Do your best to love others the way that God has loved you. Amen.